These are pink bats and they are the most popular fiberglass insulation product here in New Zealand. When it comes to insulation, fiberglass products have dominated over 90% market share for the last decade. In this video here, we're gonna talk about the different options for insulating your home. We'll cover the advantages and disadvantages of each. And stick around to the end of the video where I discuss why I believe fiberglass has had such a dominant market share and we'll let you know how pink bats ended up being pink. First up, let's talk about some of the insulation options other than fiberglass. We've got polyester, polystyrene, mineral wool, real wool, spray foam, and there was a banned product being used up until 2016 called reflective foil. Tin foil hats, anyone? Before I wrap into it, quick disclaimer, I am a builder here in New Zealand and the majority of my experience is working with fiberglass. I am interested in other options and I have seen other options being used. A large amount of this information we've got from doing our own research and it's up to you to do yours. Let's start with fiberglass. Fiberglass insulation is made from tiny glass fibers and is one of the most common types of insulation. It comes in bats, rolls, or loose filled forms and is used to insulate walls, ceilings, and floors. Fiberglass insulation was one of the only products being used on site when I first started my apprenticeship. When we first started installing it, people didn't believe in putting on safety suits or wearing dust masks, and you would end up itchy all over. Since then, the product has changed and improved, and also health and safety approaches have improved. You can see me here suiting up to insulate my recent house on the section nobody wanted. I wear dust mask, full covering, so that you can take all of that off and all of those loose fibers floating around are not on your clothes, they are contained on site. Some of the advantages of fiberglass is that it's known to be cost effective, it's fire resistant, and it's ease of installation. As a builder, it is one of the easiest products to install and to cut and manipulate and to get into the spaces you need to get it into. Some of the downfalls of fiberglass insulation is that it can slump. What this means is that when you first put it in the wall, it is mint, it is tight, it's really well fitting. But what they were finding maybe with some of the older products is there was slumping. What this means is the bats shrink both this way and this way. And so at some stage, the bats began to deteriorate and now you have areas in your wall where there is no insulation. This is because it's not a rigid product. Now I do know that attending conferences and talking to suppliers out in the marketplace that over the last number of years they have worked on the slumping issues and the products that we're installing now are far better at standing the test of time. Moving on to polyester insulation. I've only installed polyester on a couple of homes, so I'm no expert on it, but I do know that it's becoming a popular choice and it's heading more towards the mainstream. It's made from at least 45% recycled plastic. Not only that, but it's a strong, durable product. So my experience with polyester is it is very rigid and it has a long lifespan. It's rated to last up to 50 years. And those issues I talked about with fiberglass, about dust and fibers, you don't have on a polyester product. It's a far healthier choice for the installer as well as the homeowner. Obviously, we still recommend you always use a mask when you're installing your products. Look after your lungs, folks. That being said, it's a really tough product to work with on site. Typically, you can cut it one way, really easy, and then you turn it around and you go to chop it the other way, and it's like trying to saw down a tree with a blunt saw. I do know that they now have improved and they've got special insulation blades, and the recommendation is that you get a special insulation saw and you set up an insulation cutting station. If you compare that to the process of installing fiberglass bats, that is a lot of work and it makes it less desirable for the mass market right now. Generally, with a polyester product, you need to have a thicker product to achieve the same thermal rating as a fiberglass product. And so what I do know is that when we have used it in certain areas of the house and you've got cavities where you've got plumbing and you've got wires, and you're trying to get this rigid polyester product into all of that same cavity, what ends up usually happening is you cut out the surface of the insulation, so you end up compromising the insulation in that area. So that does lead to a bigger question about designing homes and service cavities and where you put your taps and your outlets 
to make sure that you're not compromising the thermal performance of your home. Talking about warming things up, I want my subs to go up. We're on a mesh to get 100k subs by the end of the year and we need you. Go ahead, click subscribe, you know you want to. Moving on to polystyrene. I've used polystyrene a couple of times, mainly in underfloor situations, in the bottom of slabs, on the edge of slabs, or in subfloors. But you can also use it in walls. So a SIPS panel, structurally insulated panel, is an internal lining, a polystyrene product, and an external lining sandwiched together. And it's used in areas down south like Otago where they need high performance. Polystyrene comes in two main forms. You have expanded polystyrene, EPS, Expanded polystyrene is lightweight and rigid and is used in walls and roof insulation. XPS, extruded polystyrene, is denser and provides high thermal resistance, making it suitable for below grade applications such as insulating concrete slabs. The benefits include moisture control, continuous insulation, and the ability to address thermal bridging. And polystyrene won't slump. It stays in its exact shape forever. One of the only disadvantages is that it must be tightly fitted in order to prevent any air loss. One of my only other comments here about polystyrene, once you start breaking it up and all those little polystyrene balls blow everywhere, it's a real pain to manage on site. And I cringe to think about how many of those tiny little balls are getting blown from site, blowing down the road, ending up in the ocean. And so it's a real mesh to control all of the polystyrene offcuts. Moving on to mineral wool insulation. Mineral wool, also known in other areas of the world as rock wool or slag wool, is made from molten rock or recycled materials. Sometimes we've used this in fire wool situations where we need a specific rating on the entire wool all the way from the slab to the roof line. A three and a half inch piece of mineral wool insulation has an R15 value, whereas a three and a half inch piece of fiberglass insulation has an R13 value. So the same thickness mineral wool versus fiberglass is about 10 to 15 percent more thermally efficient. As well as that, mineral wool is naturally moisture resistant. In saying that, it tends to be more expensive and because it's more unusual product, it's not really available on the shelf. When we've got it, we've had to order it specially in. We should also talk about one of the products that has been around since the beginning of time, natural wool. You know, the stuff that grows on the back of a sheep. It's a natural, renewable resource. It's pleasant to handle. Some of the cons is that it's a higher cost compared to synthetic options. And it can also attract pests if it's not treated properly. So then you're kind of defeating the purpose of it being natural. Spray foam is a liquid foam that expands to fill the cavities and hardens into an insulating material. It forms an airtight seal and is great in ceilings and crawl spaces. Spray foam is not really used here in New Zealand, hasn't really ever taken off. We use spray foam in really limited applications like around windows or below bottom plates or into gaps we can't get. We get it in tiny little cans. You can get a guy with a big, big can in the back of his truck and spray an entire house. I've seen it used mainly in North America. Actually in saying that we do use it as a retrofit form of insulation here in New Zealand where you can go and drill a bunch of holes in your old house and fill all the cavities. It is very dubious about how much of the cavity gets filled with spray foam, so be careful of these options. Spray foam is one of the most effective ways to insulate your home if you're doing it at the new build stage. One of the disadvantages is the cost. Spray foam insulation tends to be more expensive than traditional insulation like fiberglass. It's also got a ton of man-made chemicals in it. Lots of these things are not eligible for recycling. Now let's quickly talk about the band product, reflective foil. I think it's a bit of a joke with some people. I was talking to my dad about his first home and how cold it was and I said, what was the insulation? And he said, well, we had some special foil under the floor and then chuckled to himself. I also know one of the reasons it was banned is that because when people were reinstalling it, someone actually stapled through a electricity cable and the whole sheet became live and they electrocuted themselves. Not only was it not that great as a product, but there was up to five deaths from installing it. 
The theory behind it was that the foil would radiate the heat back into the house. I'm not sure about the science behind that and whether that was proven or disproven. You can look that up yourself. We just know that it hasn't had a good reputation both as an insulator and from a health and safety perspective. If you've used any of these other materials and have a different experience to me, we would love you to comment below on what you use, why you use it, is it good, is it bad? Let's go back to the fact that New Zealand is obsessed with fiberglass insulation. Between 2010 and 2019, it dominated over 90% of the market share. I think there's three reasons why it has dominated the market for so long. And that comes down to cost effectiveness, availability, and ease of installation. Fiberglass is a relatively inexpensive product compared to other options on the market. This makes it a very cost effective option for most people building or renovating. Alongside that, you can go to any of the merchants like ITM or Mitre 10 and get it off the shelf. It's available up and down the country. This means not only is it the path of least resistance for DIYs and homeowners, but it's the path of least resistance for us as a building company. Add to that the ease of installation. You can get an entire house done with a crew in one day. Homeowners up and down the country are familiar with the process of installing fiberglass products. And it's no different for us builders. As I said earlier in the video, it's the first insulation product I used in my apprenticeship. And for the majority of the houses we've built, we've put fiberglass in. This means it's a system we understand, we know how to use, we know how to handle. So we've talked about why New Zealand loves fiberglass insulation, but why is it pink? Well, there's a company called Pink Bats that has a 75% market share. And 50 years ago, they came up with the genius idea to put pink dye in the mix so that their product would be easily identifiable. Now, 50 years on, when you think about insulation, you think about that fluffy pink stuff, you think pink bats. Since 1961, they have been the only onshore manufacturer of fiberglass in New Zealand. They've used local materials, they've used local workers, and they have supported the construction industry for over 60 years. On a personal note, I chose to use pink bats in my house on the section nobody wanted. I've been through four winters there now. The house is really warm and cozy. It does what it says. I hope you've learned a thing or two about all the installation options here in New Zealand and that this helps you. As always, go ahead, click subscribe and thanks for watching.